It was the perfect day for it to happen. I am surrounded by friends and family enjoying the happy occasion. Outside the whirlwind of merriment are curious onlookers who are either furtively peering at the celebrating crowd or watching with envious eyes, eager to get on the guest list. My father, Harrison Williams, sat at the head of the long table and presided over the festivities. He had a big smile on his face as he finished a story that caused laughter. Numerous waiters and waitresses hurried to fulfill the various orders of the assembled guests. The waiter deftly placed a rare third glass of Chardonnay in front of my mother, Tracy Williams. She absentmindedly ran her fingers along the stem of the glass, smiled at her husband, and then turned her attention to me. The look of pride and love coming from my mother was another wonderful bonus for me. I thought about how much love and sacrifice my family had put forth to get me in this position. I was on the cusp of becoming part of the world I had dreamed of since childhood. It wasn't easy. I had to carefully schedule my college classes to coincide with my part-time job at the bank and manage to spend time with my girlfriend. For four long years, I rushed from school to work. And after work, I would come home to study and discuss my professor's theorizing with my father's real-life experience. I had to walk a thin tightrope to avoid agitating my father when we discussed radical changes in the business. Harrison Williams's business philosophy boiled down to the adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Nevertheless, sometimes I would convince my father to try out a new idea, and he would authorize a trial run to see if there would be any benefits from the new practice. Sometimes the proposed idea failed completely, and we spent countless hours discussing it, trying to come to a consensus on why it failed. Sometimes the idea was successful, but not to the extent that we had envisioned, and we carefully refined it to maximize profit. And once a new idea was a smashing success, and I had to restrain the urge to say to my father, I told you so. I was also fearless in letting my professors know which ideas passed the test and which ones they should exclude from ivory tower discussions. Many professors resented publicly exposing the failures of their business models, and my grades reflected that bias to some extent. But I felt it was my duty to share my experiences with my students so that they would not make similar mistakes when they made a living. Although my ethical stance prevented me from graduating with honors, I still received my degree which was one of the reasons for the celebration. Now armed with a degree in business, I would join my father to run the family bank that had provided our family's livelihood for six generations. I already had my eye on the girl I expected to help me become the seventh generation. Stacy Bachman sat next to me talking to her mother, who was sitting across the table from Stacy. Stacy and I have known each other our whole lives. We were classmates all through high school. We started dating in our senior year of high school, she followed me to community college, and although our time together was limited due to school and work, she and I continued our relationship. Weekend dates were rare, but still we managed to make it out. I was hell-bent on ending the relationship. In that respect, I was a very average American male. Stacy managed to restrain me with comments about wanting to marry a virgin and to divert my lust with the occasional assault. Now, five years into our relationship, the countdown had finally begun. I checked my pants pocket for the hundredth time to make sure my diamond engagement ring box was still there. After she accepted my proposal, Stacy, her friends and family could start planning the wedding. I decided to take the opportunity to assess Stacy's appearance. Stacy was petite, with dirty blonde hair and boobs that stood out on her thin frame. Kind of like Jennifer Love Hewitt. She had hazel eyes that were eye-catching. Seductive thin lips created a smile on her angular face that could win over any man. She was smart, charming, and engaging. Practically the entire town was ready to welcome her into their family. Of course, some of the potential adopters had lower motives than others. She was the object of many a man's wet dreams and fantasies as they made love to their girlfriends or wives. I continued to watch as Stacy burst out laughing in response to her mother's remark. She unconsciously brushed away a strand of hair that had fallen into her face. I thought about how I was going to reward her now that I was going to start working for my father and get a decent paycheck while he prepared me for management. I anticipated a trip to Hawaii, a Christmas vacation in London, and a three-day weekend at the beach for us. And we planned a family! I wanted a son and a daughter, but just as long as the kids were healthy, and that was the main thing. I nudged Stacy to make a small remark, and she smiled at me and gave me a brotherly pat on the shoulder, stepping into the conversation from the other side of her. I was slightly concerned by her carefree attitude, 
but considered it a result of the entire table celebrating the good fortune of Stacy and I graduating. I was soon involved in a conversation with Stacy's father. Mr. Bachman wanted to know if I was going with a group of men scheduled to go hunting in Alaska. The group was made up of the elite of the town. All the driving forces, whether doctors, lawyers, or businessmen, migrated to this collegiate clique. By inviting me, they made it clear that I was expected to join their ranks. Many of this power elite were present at the dinner table today. They came not only out of a sense of commercial loyalty, but also because of the high esteem in which the Williamses and the Bachmans were held in the community. My father helped many during his career as president of Camden Bank and Trust. My mother worked tirelessly on many community projects to help the less fortunate members of society. The Buckmans did so as well, making significant donations to charitable organizations. Charles Buckman, owner of the family factory, was the wealthiest man in Camden, and he did all of his personal and business banking with the help of my father. Now that Stacy and I are engaged, the two families will join together in a local dynasty. It will be the Camden equivalent of Prince William marrying Kate Middleton. And we'll live happily ever after, I thought, gazing adoringly at my bride-to-be. Charles Buckman rose from the table with a raised glass of wine and waited for the conversation to subside and for everyone to turn their attention to him. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today to help us celebrate. It seems like it was just yesterday when Stacy, Troy, and their classmates started school together. For all the crayon drawings that decorated our refrigerator, for all the countless hours spent doing homework, for all the times we attended your school events and cheered you on, Stacy. For making your mom and I the happiest and proudest parents when you became an adult, and I would like to properly express the love and feelings I have for you, my child. He said this with misty eyes. Stacy spontaneously stood up and rushed over to her father to hug him, and the audience broke into applause. I love you and mommy so much, daddy, she cried. This brought a new round of applause. Well, baby, let's get to the fun part. As a graduation present, we're giving you a pair of tickets to an all-expenses-paid tour of Europe for the entire summer. Stacy squealed with delight and kissed her dad and mom when they handed her the thick envelope. I started to figure out if I could take that much time off work. It didn't matter if I couldn't. I was sure that Stacy and her lucky girlfriend would be able to enjoy the trip of a lifetime. It would push back our wedding date, but at least I would be able to save up money while Stacy had fun. Deciding it was now or never, I stood up and walked over to Stacy. I dug in my pocket and picked up the jewelry box. I walked over to Stacy, and Mr. and Mrs. Bachman stepped back, graciously giving Stacy and I the center seat. Stacy looked at me perplexed as I stood next to her. I began. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who came here tonight to help celebrate our graduation from college. And while to Mr. Bachman it may have seemed like yesterday, to me it was like Chinese water torture. This joking remark caused laughter in the audience. But the only thing that made it all tolerable was the wonderful woman standing next to me. In first grade, we drank milk from the same carton. In sixth grade, we were sent to the principal's office together for passing notes, I said with a raised eyebrow, which caused another round of laughter. Eventually, I wised up, I continued, and asked her out on a date at my high school graduation. After that, we both went to college here, and although school and work didn't allow me to see her as often as I would have liked, it made me appreciate her even more. I turned to Stacy and looked into her face. And I really appreciate you, Stacy. I've known for a long time what you mean to me. I've loved you since first grade. I know what you will mean to me for the rest of my life because I intend to say, I love you to you for the rest of my life. Dropping to one knee, I presented the box to her and began to open it. I noticed that Stacy's eyes went wide and she brought her hand up to her open mouth. She was beginning to show signs of hyperventilation. Stacy Ellen Bachman, will you marry me? By now, the restaurant was dead silent, and all eyes were focused on the dramatic scene before them. They held their breath, waiting for what was about to come out at Stacy's shout of approval. I continued to look lovingly at Stacy's face, which reflected the shock of the proposal. Stacy's eyes stared wildly at the table, then at me, then at the table, then at me. As the pregnant pause lasted, an unsettling thought started in my brain. What at first seemed like disbelieving shock now turned to panic. She looked down at the table again, ignoring me kneeling with a two-carat flawless diamond ring outstretched toward her. David! She begged pleadingly and rushed to the front door. 
The scraping of a chair being hurriedly removed from the table was heard. The disbelieving and shocked onlookers saw someone running after Stacy. The person turned around to look at me as he ran past and chased after Stacy. It was David Porter, my best friend, and the guy I was going to ask to be my best man. The consequences of Stacy and David's actions reached the consciousness of everyone present, and all their attention was on me, kneeling and coming to grips with what was happening. I slowly rose from my knee and began frantically stuffing the jewelry box back into my pocket. I started walking zombie-like toward the back entrance away from Stacy. I didn't look at anyone, blindly traversing the steps leading away from the building. Eyes full of unshed tears saw me off as I passed my car and began the long, hard walk home. I sat at my desk, the rays of the morning sun flooding my office. Turning my chair, I stared sullenly at the empty buildings crumbling in the town square. One of these abandoned buildings was the site of my proposal fiasco. It's been six years since my humiliation in front of the whole town. Six long years of being the butt of jokes all over Washington County. Six long years of being laughed at behind my back. The restaurant went on. Stacy moved on. David moved on. The city moved on. The whole damn world moved on. The only one who hadn't moved on was me, chained by legacy and necessity to Camden Bank and Trust. The intercom buzzed. Troy, Mrs. Fuller is here to see you. I felt a slight annoyance before I said, send her in. No sooner had the door opened than I was already up from the table and heading towards her. Let me take that, Mrs. Fuller, I said, looking with some anxiety at the large box the woman was carrying. Damn it, Janet, you should have taken it to her, I thought. I looked at the thin, attractive brunette who was accompanying the infirm old lady. I picked up the box and quickly set it on my desk, then helped Mrs. Fuller into a chair. How are you, Mrs. Fuller? Is there anything I can do for you? No, no, that you don't, child. I just wanted to bring you a jar of heirloom tomatoes from my vegetable garden. I still remember how much you love them. Despite all the worries, my mood lightened when I remembered all the trips to Mrs. Fuller's garden as a child. Planting and digging up potatoes, onions, and peanuts. Setting stakes for tomatoes. Peas and bean steaks to hold on to. Endless watering of cantaloupes, honey melons, and watermelons. Picking and plucking corn. Climbing apple, peach, and plum trees to harvest. It's amazing that what I now perceive as hard labor was a joy when I was a child. Maybe civilization has it the other way around, I suggested. Mrs. Fuller, may I offer you something to drink? Well, I won't say no to a glass of lemonade or sweet tea if it's not too much trouble. Of course not. Miss Temple, if you don't mind. Without noticing Mrs. Fuller, Janet Temple winked at me and said, Sure thing, Troy. She went off to do her errand, ignoring the barely perceptible look of irritation on my face. I sat down in the chair next to Mrs. Fuller, as befits her status as a very favorite customer. Are you sure there's nothing I can do for you today, Mrs. Fuller? I could see the hesitation. The kind old lady was agonizing over how to solve this dilemma. Mr. Williams? Troy, Mrs. Fuller, I'll always be Troy to you, I interrupted her gently. The lady smiled, pleased that I recognized her status above mine. Thank you, Troy. I have this situation. I need a personal loan in the amount of $20,000. At that moment, Janet Temple entered the office with a tray containing two glasses filled with ice cubes and a pitcher of lemonade. She poured the drinks and left. I need a loan, but I don't have anything to provide it, Mrs. Fuller said shamefacedly. Don't do it, 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 my brain ordered. May I ask what you need the money for, Mrs. Fuller? This is my grandson. He is finishing his last year of college, but something happened with his paperwork for his student loan. I told him I would try to pay his tuition until the problem with his documents was resolved. How long do you need the money for? I mentally sighed as I realized I was going to do it. I can pay it off in a year, Troy. He'll sort out the paperwork on the other loan and it'll be offset against your loan. Besides, he'll get the grant money and reimburse me. Besides, he'll have a good job after he graduates, so there won't be a problem with the payments. Is it for Paul? Your daughter's oldest boy? Do they still live in Seattle? I asked, trying to remember Donna's son and the few times I had met him when they came to visit Mrs. Fuller. Then I remembered how I had been in love with Donna Fuller years ago. 
but that was just a youthful fantasy. I smiled regretfully, done with the past. I mentally estimated the payments as we continued to talk and asked her if she was comfortable with the monthly payments. She paused and asked what they would be for a year and a half. Not trusting myself 100%, I pulled out a calculator and gave her the result. She agreed that it was suitable, so I called Tom Jenkins in the loan department, told him the terms, and asked him to prepare the loan documents for Mrs. Fuller to sign. We spent the next 30 minutes reminiscing and drinking lemonade. I then escorted Mrs. Fuller to the loan department and assigned the very capable Tom Jenkins to take care of Mrs. Fuller. Mrs. Fuller insisted on kissing me on the cheek and said, Thank you, Troy. You remind me of your father. There aren't many bankers giving unsecured credit these days. Mrs. Fuller, your family has always cooperated with us. I know your word is strong enough, I assured an old family friend. You just keep sending me tomatoes and maybe an apple pie, I pleaded, and Mrs. Fuller laughed and said I'd have pie tomorrow. Back in my office, I found Janet Temple sorting tomatoes and separating the ripe red ones from the green ones. What are you doing with my tomatoes? I asked. Troy, we're having BLT sandwiches for dinner tonight. Who is this will you speak of, Miss Temple? I walked up behind her and pressed myself against her. She smiled. By the way, Miss Temple, it wouldn't hurt to be a little more professional in the office. Yes, Mr. Williams. She turned to face me and put her arm around my broad shoulders. You gave her an unsecured loan, didn't you? And lowered the interest rate, so we're not actually making anything on this deal. Yes, it is, Janet. That's Miss Temple for you, Troy. She corrected her feckless boss and kissed me again. If you keep falling for every bad luck story, you won't last long in business. If that happens, I'll just take my tomatoes and get a job somewhere. Our tomatoes. Janet corrected, placing her hands on top of mine. My tomatoes, I replied, gently stroking her tits. Ours. Mine. Ours. Mine. A quiet giggle came from my office. Turns out bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches were a daily specialty in my apartment that evening, and the Janet Temple was a coveted dessert. As dawn broke, I woke up and bustled around getting ready for my morning run. Donning my running clothes, I kissed Janet on the top of her head, which made her smile as she stretched and woke up. Why don't you go back to bed and work out here? Don't tempt me. Are you going to shower here or at your place? Why do you ask? Because I don't want to start taking a shower and get under ice water because you've already used it up, I explained. I could wait for you and we could shower together. Janet suggested. I paused. No, she pouted sadly. Well, I guess I better go home and get dressed for work. When are you going to start leaving clothes here already, Janet? I asked. It'll make things easier. Oh, Troy, let's not start that topic again. You go and have a great run and I'll take a quick shower and I'll see you at work. She kissed me and encouraged me to go for a run while she got ready to clean up. I prepared for my run by doing warm-ups and stretching exercises. I looked around my residence. Not many people can say they live in the same building they work in. Even fewer who live in a three-story bank building that takes up an entire city block. As I do many mornings, I marveled at the Greco-Roman architectural style of granite stone and Doric columns rising majestically at the building's front entrance. My ancestor built the first permanent building in the fledgling city. He made a good study of the effect he wanted to produce. Prosperity and permanence were the safeguards that encouraged others to build. They exactly copied the architectural theme of the bank, and the entire town square epitomized wealth, employment, and industry. Or was, I thought sourly, looking at the ghostly buildings of the dilapidated town square. Now my bank remained the last bastion, the last reminder of a past that had brought so many regrets. As I ran, the calibrated pace broke the silence with only the sounds of my footsteps and breathing. I use this time as silence, a time for reflection and concentration. My first thought was about business, about Camden Bank and Trust. It was besieged by enemies, both from within and without. Ever since I took over as president of the bank, I had to remain vigilant every day. It was enough to make one wrong move, and all my hard work and that of my father and previous generations would be taken away from me. 
So many decisions to make and no one to help me. Not for the first time, as I finished my run and walked up the stairs to my apartment on the third floor, I felt completely alone. How I wished I could forget about all my problems. A shower and a quick rest would be enough. People depended on me. I undressed and stepped gingerly into the shower. In a few seconds, the hot water turned to cold splashes. Another grievance I'll have to express to Janet, I thought, as I hurried into the tub. At nine in the morning, I would sit at my desk and work until official banking hours began. In fact, I had been working since seven in the morning, preparing transactions on behalf of the bank. If all went well, it would go on like this all day. At 9.25, the intercom bell rang. Mr. Williams, you have company. The strangeness in Janet's voice alerted my defenses. Why hadn't she informed me of the identity of these visitors? The little voice mentally told me that I should refuse the callers, referring to my busy work schedule, because of which I couldn't meet with the visitors today. Tell another employee to take care of any problem that might arise. Realizing that I had paused unnecessarily in answering Janet's call, I hesitantly told her to show the visitors into my office. The door opened, and Carla Robbins, Susan Moy, and Stacy Ellen Porter, aka Bachman, entered. It was the first time I'd seen Stacy up close in six years. The passing years had done her good. Her facial features had changed from their former angular beauty to a more rounded one. She had changed from a girl into a young woman in the prime of her life. Hey, Troy. She tried desperately to catch my gaze. I knew she was trying to start a dialogue before the barricade started. In response, I waved my hand toward the chairs on their side of the table. Carla tried to hug me, but I was aware of my reluctance to make bodily contact with the three of them. If I refused Carla's hug, Stacy couldn't take offense at the rejection. The three ladies quickly settled into their chairs. I sat down at my desk. How are you, Carla, Susan, Mrs. Porter? What can I do for you ladies today? Stacy flinched at the cold politeness in my reply. There was no warmth in the greeting, no indication that the passage of time had created a willingness to forgive a past offense. She noticed that my gaze was fixed on the classmates accompanying her. Please, Troy, I'm still Stacy. I would appreciate it if you would call me by my first name. I'll keep that in mind, Mrs. Porter. I ask again, what can I do for you today? It's been 10 years since we graduated, Troy. We're on the reunion committee. We're trying to get new members on the committee and support the reunion. Susan took the lead in explaining the purpose of their visit. I was silent. Over the course of my career, I had learned that silence was a necessary and effective negotiating tool. Of course, this was not the usual business transaction I was used to, but the same principles applied. Well, Troy, asked Susan with desperation. I'm sorry, Susan. I didn't hear anything that required me to comment. Susan sighed. Why don't you help out and head up the committee, Troy? A moment passed before I answered. Susan, isn't it traditional for the president of the graduating class to head the reunion committee? Susan hesitated, realizing where the conversation was leading. Yes, Troy, but... Refresh my memory, Carla. I turned to the woman I interrupted. Who was our class president? David Porter. That's right, Carla. I think you're talking to the wrong person. David already said he wasn't going to be on the committee, Troy, Stacy explained. I didn't give any indication that I heard Stacy's comment or was going to respond to it. We could really use your help, Troy, Carla offered. I understand, Carla, but since I won't be attending the reunion, I don't see the need to be on your committee. I pressed the intercom button, Miss. Temple, please come in. I could tell that this restless trio was looking for a new mode of attack, for all three of them insisted that I must be present. Before I could comment, Janet Temple entered the office. Miss Temple, please escort our guests out of my office. I regret to inform you that I have an urgent matter, so you'll have to excuse me. Come on, Troy, you owe it to yourself to attend our classmate reunion, Carla insisted with the last of her strength. I turned my attention back to my three classmates. Before you all leave, I'd like to tell you a little story about what you owe people, I began sourly. A beautiful woman walks into a bar. Before she can sit down, a man appears in front of her. Madam, he says, for your information, I am one of the richest men in the world. I am so overwhelmed by your beauty 
that I am willing to pay you $10 million to spend one hour making love to you. At first, the woman was shocked by such an offer. Then she begins to think about what $10 million can buy. Okay, I will make love to you for $10 million, she replies. Then the man asked, Will you sleep with me for $5? Now the woman is very upset by such an insult. $5? What do you take me for? She shouts to the man. We've already figured that out. Now we're just discussing the price. Do you understand the meaning of the word duty in this story? I asked my three classmates. Perhaps I can give you a better example. Imagine some poor dumb bastard thinks he's found the perfect woman for him, but he gets humiliated when she runs off with his best friend. What the hell do you think he's due? An opportunity to jump in and do her a favor when he sees her for the first time in years? There was dead silence and icy stares in response to the insults. I left my office through the back door, which saved me the awkward situation of shaking their hands. I heard Stacy's voice asking me to stop. Once again, I chose to ignore my traitor. I quickly climbed the stairs and paced the apartment. I continued to wander around the apartment. I systematically checked the views from the windows, hoping to spot the departure of the trio of classmates who had ambushed me. I heard the door open and Janet's footsteps came toward me. I spun on my wheels and hissed, NEVER! NEVER! Never do this to me again if you want to keep your job. Do you understand me? She recoiled in shock at the venomous note in my strained voice. I'm sorry, Troy. I didn't know how to feel about that. She replied with a dismissive apology. Well, you damn well better find another way of this. That woman ever comes to me again. They didn't tell me who they were. They just said they were your schoolmates, she protested. I paused for a moment to calm down, but there was still awkwardness between us. Are they gone yet? I asked, looking out one of the windows. In my peripheral vision, I noticed Janet nod at my question. I could see that she almost cried at my abuse, but she nodded in agreement, not trusting her voice not to break into sobs. Time to get back to work then. I roughly walked out of my apartment and headed downstairs to my office. Janet stayed in my apartment to clean up and fix her makeup before appearing at her desk. When closing time came, I was alone in my apartment all night. This trend continued for two weeks while Janet focused solely on her work and I on mine. On Thursday afternoon, just before closing time, Janet came into my office. With tears in her eyes, she asked me in a trembling voice, Will you ever forgive me? I walked over to her and hugged her as she started to cry. We went upstairs to my apartment, and I did my best to make up for all the pain I had caused her. By Friday morning, everything was back to normal. Saturday morning, we spent relaxing in my bed. We were talking into a pillow when she broached the subject. Why do you hate her so much, Troy? Why can't you get over her? She asked, drawing lazy circles on my chest with her fingernail. I knew who she meant. I decided to tell her it was none of her damn business. I sighed. You moved here four years ago, Janet, so you don't know the whole story. I'll tell it to you once and only once, and I'll never discuss it with you again. Deal? She looked at me with her big brown eyes and nodded seriously. You know about her and me and how I made a complete ass of myself at prom by proposing to her. I know you must have heard that story a thousand times in this town. Her look spoke the truth of my words. Even after six years, I was still ridiculed by the whole town. By this time, my act had become an urban legend, and it was endlessly discussed. You have to realize that we all grew up around each other, played with each other, went to school with each other. I paused, then banished the reluctance to say their names. David and Stacy have been my closest friends since kindergarten. Stacy insisted we play house with her, and we attended countless lunches with imaginary pies, cokes, cakes, ice cream, and candy. One day I would be a father and David would be our baby. The next day, David would be a father and I would be their child. Stacy, of course, was always the mother who dictated our actions. As we got older, David and I fell into that period of childhood where we thought all girls had STDs and avoided Stacy like the plague. Stacy took it hard at first, but then she moved on to hanging out with all her girlfriends. David and I were as close as brothers. We were at each other's houses every day, playing Little League Baseball or Boy Scouts or playing soccer. We always had something going on. As I began to remember, I realized that I couldn't help but smile weakly at the memory. But it was short-lived as I continued the story. We would still see each other. 
All of our parents socialized at the country club, at parties and charity events. And of course, we were in the same class and had the same classes and teachers. Then middle school came, and something magical happened to all the girls. Puberty began to turn girls into fantastic creatures. Boobs began to appear and asses filled skirts and pants. And like every teenager, well, at least every heterosexual teenager, we started lusting after these girls we'd been ignoring for years. But they weren't going to make life easy for any of us guys. So we had to jump through hoops like carrying books for them, buying them cheap bracelets or rings, or letting them know that another boy was paying attention to us. That's exactly what happened to me and David. We started to see Stacy in a new light and amazingly, we both wanted her. And even more of a surprise, we didn't want the other one to succeed. And the biggest surprise of all, Stacy decided she wanted David. You know, even at such an early age, being rejected was really hard, but I recovered. I started dating David and Stacy, but I also continued to be friends with them. At some point, Stacy and David had a breakdown. He started cheating on her and openly dating others. This threw Stacy off balance, and the week before prom, she came to me and asked me to take her to prom. I went to David and told him. He said he was okay with it. He wasn't going to see her again. We started dating, and feelings developed between us. I started doing things besides dating. Helping her with her homework, washing her car, you know, stuff like that. I even began to spend time getting to know her parents better. I would go to them and talk them into playing a game of chess and losing to Mr. Bachman, always listening to him lecture about whatever interested him. Usually it was business, especially concerning Bachman's enterprises. He was constantly throwing out derogatory phrases like, in business, the big ones eat the little ones or do unto others before they do unto you. I just sat and listened about the world according to Charles Bachman, hoping to impress him. College came and Stacy knew I was determined to prepare for our future. We had talked about getting engaged and getting married a long time ago. She knew I would be ready as soon as we graduated from college. So it wasn't a lightning bolt that came out of the blue. She knew. We talked about the kids and everything. She should have expected. I grudgingly picked at my words to make verbal sense of a situation I still couldn't explain, much less understand. She even picked out that damn ring. I commented, looking at Janet in hopes that it made sense. Janet nodded and patted my arm to let me know she understood. Gathering my courage, I continued. I don't know when David came back on the scene. I had no idea she and David were dating. If she had told me, maybe I wouldn't be here today. Maybe none of this would have happened. But I continued to see her every day at school and see her every weekend. And I didn't have the slightest idea that anything was wrong. So here I am in front of the whole world getting a kick out of it. Everyone laughing at me and discussing Stacy and David's little Romeo and Juliet style romance. I never really thought about how Stacy felt, but it was enough for me that Stacy decided to take it with her to Europe, giving it to her parents as a graduation present. She runs away with him. They go to London, to Paris, to Rome, to Athens, and I stay in Camden with my heart ripped out of my body. Every fucking day I have to be manly, go to my job and pretend no one knows what happened to me. Stacy and David returned home and had a whirlwind wedding to dispel rumors of their European affair. Afterward, they were driven out of state until the uproar subsided. Stacy and David were hired by one of Charles Bachman's subsidiaries in California until all the hoopla subsided. In the meantime, Charles Bachman is mad as hell at me for putting his daughter and his family in a situation of public ridicule. My little performance had far-reaching consequences. The town was divided on who was to blame for this fiasco. Unfortunately, Charles Bachman wasn't going to stand by and let people defame his little girl. He visited my dad and I at the bank and completely blamed it on me. He then told us that he had looked into the matter and decided that our town needed another bank to break what he called our stranglehold on the town. He was there to close his accounts. They would be invested in a new bank that had opened across town, Bachman's Savings Bank and Loans. My father tried to convince him not to do it. It would have caused a serious rift in the bank's finances. But Charles Buckman wasn't going to say no. So he took his money, and my father had to find alternative sources of financing to meet his obligations. Word got to him that he was in a tight spot, so he negotiated unfavorably. 
Commercial lenders were charging him exorbitant rates, and he had to settle to keep the bank afloat. It was a daily, hourly struggle to keep the doors open. But Charles Buckman wasn't finished. All Buckman's industry employees' paychecks were written to Buckman's savings and loans accounts, and all employees were forced to open accounts at Buckman's for direct deposits, debit, and credit cards. Then there were auto and home loans at rates my father would not have been able to meet because of the problems we were facing. Customers were leaving in droves. Bachman's ATMs flooded the neighborhood as small businessmen were persuaded to trade our machines for theirs. Basically, he had us in a vice and he wasn't going to give up. He told all the local entrepreneurs that they had better move to his place on the other side of town. They did, which is what led to the urban blackness in the town square. This led to a decline in bank traffic, and that meant we kept losing money. I fought side by side with my father every day, trying to atone for my mistake that had led to all this trouble. I convinced my father to give me access to some of the dwindling funds for stock market trading and arbitrage trades to stop the bleeding. Fortunately, I was successful in that endeavor, but we continued to make losses. My father was the president of the bank, but because of generational change, he had relatives to whom he reported to, and they started making a fuss that because of my father's management, they were losing money. Lawsuits started being filed by second and third cousins wanting to gain an advantage and wrest control of the bank from my father. He kept getting up and fighting every day. I was right by his side, but the stress was too much for my mother. Charles Bachman succeeded in getting us to lose our country club membership. Mother lost her positions in all the charitable organizations. She was ostracized by the whole town. My mother, who never hurt anyone, was torn apart by every bitch in this town. Her blood pressure spiked, and the day came when my dad was called to the hospital. My mom had suffered a stroke. After that, he was never the same again. He handed over the day-to-day -day work of the bank to me, and he took care of my mom. I would come home and watch him take care of my mom. When he had free time, then and only then would he discuss the bank. She lasted two months before she passed away. After that, my father became the epitome of the walking dead. Three weeks after she died, he had a heart attack. I had lost everything I held dear in less than a year, and now I was given the responsibility of running the bank. I was not sufficiently prepared for this responsibility, but now it has been given to me. I was looking for every penny I could find. And there were a lot of people who wanted to see me collapse, except Charles Bachman to take the bank's assets. I was under tremendous pressure. The situation was so desperate that at one point I had to sell my parents' house and my house to support myself in some way. Then I moved into the bank building. All of our tenants moved into the Buckman's building, so I had the space available. I converted the space to a kitchen and bathroom, but everything else is just open space. I had to turn off the boiler in the building to save on electricity. That's why I can't take a hot shower the source of hot water for the whole building is a regular domestic water heater. Now you know why I live here, in an empty cave with marble tiles and insufficient hot water. As for the day-to-day -day struggles of the bank, you have an idea of what I went through. From the first days of my assumption of office, I tried to keep the bank afloat. I had to resort to speculating in risky currency arbitrage and betting on minute-by-minute market fluctuations. At the same time, I knew that if anyone found out about the bank's vulnerable position, they could cut us off at the knees. I've had to offer loans to risky businesses that no banking institution would touch. And you know about the ledgers, how I present false figures to show that the bank is safe. But in fact, the real accounts show how much trouble I'm in. If they fall into the hands of the auditors, I'll be finished and I'll end up in jail. That's why the Soren oil venture is so important to me. As you know, I've been working on this deal every day for the last two years. If I can pull it off, I'll be solvent again. I'll be able to pay off the bank and my creditors and stop robbing Peter to pay off Paul. I'll be able to keep legitimate books and not worry about my head ending up on the cutting board. Information is knowledge, Janet. That's why I have all these folders in my desk drawers. I have to stay ahead of whatever Charles Bachman is trying to do to end me. You think I like keeping confidential files on him, Stacy and David? I have to do it to make sure I cover all the bases. Think about it. I have to keep tabs on the woman who broke my heart. I have to keep tabs on my once best friend. And I hate it. I fucking hate it, but I have to do it. I finally paused, amazed at myself for finally broaching the subject with someone, 
and at the psychological release I felt after the confession. Janet looked at me with gratitude for opening up and trusting her. But Troy, she said, are you sure you can pull off this deal with Sorrent Oil? Aren't you afraid of dealing with a Siberian oil field? Janet, as I have explained to you, my French acquaintances have done everything possible to make this a reality. Once the oil wells penetrate the field, the oil will be refined at a refinery to be built on the coast of the Bering Sea. From there, tankers will take the oil to ports on the west coast of the United States and unload it. The time difference and distance from Middle Eastern supplies will make it extremely favorable. It will be as close to the truth as it has ever been. The only downside is that a lot of players are starting to get interested in it. It's unavoidable. You can never achieve complete secrecy. Sorrent Oil's share price has been skyrocketing lately, so someone knows what it has in store. But I'm close to getting a controlling interest, and once I do, I can dictate terms and success will be assured. I just have to stay in the game no matter how high the stock goes, I explained. Then I can be free of the Buckmans. I can buy out the rest of my pissed off relatives, end all the litigation, put the bank on solid ground, and I can finally let David and Stacy go and start living my life again. I'm ready, Janet. I'm ready to commit to someone and live out the rest of my days. When I looked directly at her, she realized exactly what I was implying. Her eyes widened and she caught her breath. The concept of time disappeared. The notion of anxiety was set aside. All that mattered was the primal need to connect with another being. Only for these fleeting moments could I forget everything in the world. So I tried to cherish them. It was already noon when we finally got out of bed, showered and dressed. She told me she had to go to her mom's house for a sleepover. We arranged to meet on Sunday night. I spent some time texting some overseas friends online and then decided to go for an afternoon run. As soon as I went outside to do my warm up and stretching, I saw her leaning against my battered pickup truck. As much as I wanted to avoid a confrontation, I decided it was best to go ahead and get it over with. As I approached, she got up from my truck. Didn't think you'd be out today, Troy, she remarked. What would you have done if I hadn't? I asked. I'd go back tomorrow and wait. What if I don't show up tomorrow? Then I would come to your office tomorrow and wait all day while you refused to see me, and the whole town would have another laugh at our expense, she explained. Well, then it's a good thing I'm here so you won't be embarrassed in front of the whole town, isn't it? I replied venomously. The rant shook her, but she continued nonetheless. Troy, I just want to tell you that I made a mistake, a huge mistake, and I hurt you. That was never my intention. She looked at me with pleading eyes. For heaven's sake, Troy, you surprised me and I panicked. You have no idea the pressure a proposal puts on a girl. I was put on display and I was expected to give you an answer in front of the whole town? I interrupted. No, Stacy, you're not getting off that easy. We've had all these discussions. You even showed me what kind of ring you wanted. So don't just stand there and tell me how I surprised and embarrassed you. I wasn't the one who ran out the door. David Porter chased me, I growled back. Yeah, Troy, I ran and David ran after me and we turned out to be cowards and ran off to Europe together. But I was coming to my senses when I finally realized how screwed up I was. I went to my dad and told him I was coming back to you because I love you. He became furious and told me that I had already made him a laughing stock and that I would not be allowed to repeat that mistake by returning to you. He told me how he had publicly ended all personal and business dealings with your family and would not allow me to make a fool of him again. The next thing I knew, I was married to David and banished across the country until my father saw fit for us to return. My marriage was a mistake, Troy. David never loved me. He just liked the idea of being Charles Bachman's son-in-law. He just thought it was some colossal joke to sneak up behind your back and play me. And after that night, he felt pressure to help me. But he never loved me, Troy. Otherwise, he wouldn't be chasing other women night after night. That's if he can get away from my father. David plays some huge psychological role in my dad's life because he has a son. And my dad absorbs everything and nothing is too good for his son, David, she remarked wryly. Stacy closed her eyes and said, If I could somehow spare you this pain, I would. My act cost me the best friend I've ever had, and I'll never get him back. It cost me the man I loved most in the world. Even though I forced myself to remain cold and detached, inwardly I reacted. I'd known this woman for most of my life. Surely she knew what buttons to push. 
Therefore, to protect myself, I had to respond harshly and push her out of my life. Yes, Stacy, you can take the pain away from me. Just tell me how I get over losing you? Tell me how I survive losing both of my parents in the same month? Tell me how I survive day after day despite your father and your husband's attempts to destroy me? Tell me how I survive being an outcast in society, being kicked out of the country club and all social organizations? Tell me how I can sleep normally without waking up from the nightmares you've given me. The fierce questioning at a rapid pace threw Stacy back and I saw tears come to her eyes. I knew I had to escape or be forever damned in my desire to possess her. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go for a run and forget about you again. Barely containing herself, she nodded, and I turned away from her and began to prepare for my first step. I almost tripped when she sobbed. Okay, Troy, I made an effort and now I'm going to live with the consequences. One last thing, I'd like you to reconsider your decision not to go to the reunion tonight. You still have plenty of friends among our classmates who would love to see you. And for those who don't, your presence will prove that you are not a coward. I pretended I hadn't heard her last remark and began my run. The last untainted thing in my life, the zen of running, was now absent, and I had barely gone a mile before I stopped on a bench in a city park and, hidden from view, began to cry. I began to realize that if I lived to be a hundred years old, Stacy would still haunt me. I stayed there for the rest of the day, trying to decide what to do. I looked up at the imposing country club building. Nothing symbolized the exclusivity of the entire city like it. Only the rich and powerful were admitted here. The rest of us were forbidden entry. But on special occasions, such as high school reunions, minorities, the oppressed, the downtrodden who had never had their standing, were given a brief glimpse into a way of life they would never know. I walked past a few classmates admiring the splendor of the surroundings and nodded to them. Even though I had been banished from this view six years ago, it no longer held my interest. Down an immaculate hallway with plush carpeting, decorative vases, landscape paintings, all the trappings of grandeur leading to the banquet room. At the entrance was the obligatory table emblazoned with the Camden High Tigers logo. Behind it sat my classmate Susan Moi, whom I'd last seen in my office, trying to talk me into working the reunion. Her eyes widened at my approach. Troy Williams, I announced to her, as if I had to remind her who I was. I didn't check in, so I guess I'll have to pay a late fee, won't I, Susan? Taking the money from me, she said embarrassedly, It'll only take a minute, Troy. She started typing rapidly on the laptop. I stood aside while Susan worked with the other classmates who had pre-registered. They were given name badges with a picture of the graduates and their past accomplishments. They were then handed gift bags and allowed to proceed to the banquet hall. Some classmates said hello to me, some ignored me, but the hallway still had an uncomfortable atmosphere. The laptop printer finally spit out my makeshift badge and Susan slid it into a flimsy plastic holder, which was very different from the finished laminated badges waiting on the table to be picked up. I pinned the badge to my shirt, took the gift bag Susan had offered me, and lazily peered into it, looking at the various cheap trinkets inside. Finding nothing I couldn't live without, I placed the bag on a pile of similar bags dumped by the trash can and entered the banquet hall. Maybe it was due to my heightened paranoia, but I sensed a decrease in the volume of conversation as I entered the room. Not wanting to confirm my fears, I headed toward the bar. I hastily paid $10 for an overpriced gin and tonic cocktail. After tasting the drink, I was almost tempted to return it because of the cheap gin. Instead, I walked away, holding my drink like a shield to avoid engaging in conversation with anyone. This only alienated most of my classmates. Some continued to chat with me, and despite the awkward first comments, I was beginning to enjoy being with a crowd of old friends when David and Stacy entered the room. David was dressed in a business suit to distinguish himself from the others. For this evening, a casual form of dress was chosen. From the very beginning, he was eager to show his superiority by looking down on everyone. His aloof demeanor suited Charles Bachman's protege. Stacy, on the other hand, was wearing a simple black dress and was immediately mobbed by her classmates, insisting that she join them on the dance floor to take part in electric slide. I watched as David tried to object, but she ignored him to take center stage on the floor. The simple pleasure of doing the dance moves attracted several other classmates to join her on the floor to join her and enjoy the music. As soon as the song ended, she turned back to David, and I saw him make a remark that she obviously didn't like. Another song started playing, and Stacy tried to pull David onto the dance floor. 
He resisted until she finally gave up. She stayed by his side, just watching the dance until her girlfriends dragged her onto the floor again. For the rest of the evening, there was a strange dichotomy. A passive Stacy next to David and an animated, relaxed Stacy dancing on the dance floor. But never with a guy. Whenever anyone approached Stacy, he would ask David for permission to dance with his wife. He always stubbornly objected until the guy left. As the dance went on, Stacy became increasingly embarrassed by his behavior. With each refusal from David, the argument became more explicit and more insistent. Fortunately for Stacy, her friends kept coming over to give her a chance to relax on the floor. Her dancing on the floor pleased every man in the room, and I suspect there were quite a few women among them who would have been ready to come out of the closet if only Stacy had beckoned them. Still, she faithfully returned to David after each dance, her face reflecting her growing displeasure. She begged him to dance with her, but apparently the titans of industry are not allowed to have fun. Their irritation became more and more apparent, and there were fewer and fewer people willing to dance with Stacy as they were afraid of escalating the argument. At that moment, Stacy looked down at the floor and caught my gaze. Without asking permission, she left David and walked across the floor to me. All eyes were on us as she held out her hand and said, Dance with me. David's face could have been seriously injured by his stare. Shit, I had nothing to lose. I crawled behind Stacy, who continued to hold my hand, leading me toward the floor. I thought you said you weren't coming to the reunion. I replied, Not until they told me what a big ass I would be if I didn't come. Stacy giggled at my reaction as the intro to the slow dance number began. Her eyes widened as she feared I would reject the idea of body contact with her. Instead, I shrugged and opened my arms, assuming a pose close to a dance pose. She stepped toward me. I wrapped my arms around her and we started swaying to a slow ballad that had become popular 10 years ago when we were seniors in high school. I felt her hand move up my arm. Then she moved even closer to me and we continued to twirl slowly among our classmates on the crowded, darkened dance floor. I could smell her shampoo, her soap, and her perfume. It overwhelmed my sense of smell. All those heady, desirable scents were pushing me closer and closer to the point of no return. I closed my eyes and enjoyed the fantasies in my head as we continued our dance. I was lost in my one world of contentment. Those few minutes made it bearable. Made me believe. Suddenly, I realized that the music had stopped. The lights were burning brightly for a quick dance, and I was still doing the dance steps with Stacy deep in reverie. In full view of everyone, including David. Out of place again, in public. There was loud laughter from the side. Fred Carter was on one knee, pantomiming a proposal, his outstretched hand holding an imaginary ring, and the people around him were laughing. I quickly pulled away from Stacy and rushed over to him. He quickly stood up from his defenseless position and looked concerned as I walked toward him. The laughter died down as I got closer. The DJ must have wanted to see what would happen next because no song came on after the slow song. Fred Carter, now co-owner of the Ford dealership in town with his father, my classmate, the guy I played on the high school soccer team with, turned pale, anticipating me beating the crap out of him in front of his wife, our friends, and classmates. He even flinched when I stopped next to him. I looked at the chubby, balding man and compared him to the man he'd been 10 years ago. The future did not bode well for Fred Carter. I spoke loud enough for everyone to hear. Sophomore year, Fred, do you remember the night you, your mother, and your older sister came to my house? Fred's eyes widened, and I realized he wanted to beg me to keep quiet. Your mother howled in pain, and so did you and your sister. Do you remember what she told my father, Fred? Do you remember how she told him about your father's drinking? Remember how she told my father how he was squandering all the money your family had by getting drunk? Remember how she begged my father to help you all? Do you remember what my father did? Do you remember how he came to your house, picked up your drunken father and drove him to a rehab center 150 miles from home that night? Do you remember how my mother insisted that your family stay with us for that week? Do you remember crying yourself to sleep in my room that night, Fred? Do you remember when my father opened a line of credit for your mother so your family could survive while your father dried up? Do you remember when my parents came to your house with groceries so you'd have something to eat? And that's after he hooked up your utilities again. Do you remember how my father restructured your father's business loan so he wouldn't go into default and my father wouldn't take the business away from him? 
Do you remember how my father made sure your father attended AA after he was released from the program? Remember when you and your father came back one night and swore that you would do anything for us as a token of eternal gratitude? Remember the day your heartless father sent you to withdraw money from the Buckman's accounts? Do you remember how ashamed you felt for such treachery? Remember how my father treated you with dignity and respect? Remember that the next time you decide to insult me, you son of a bitch, I said bitterly. I looked around the crowd. I see at least eight other people here tonight who would have a similar story to tell. But I'm going to let you all go because honestly, none of you are worth the trouble. I ventured, looking at them with blazing eyes. No one could catch my gaze. I turned and walked toward the exit. At least no one would ever forget our 10th reunion. Walking quickly across the parking lot, I heard the tempo of high heels clacking three times behind each step I took in an attempt to catch up with me. I didn't need to explain who was chasing me. The continuation of this story will be on your screen or in the description below the video. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel.